Hello, and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation Wellness Wednesday. My name is Laura Summers with the Community Programs Team for the Parkinson's Foundation. Today, we are pleased to bring you Parkinson's in the Hospital, Why Being Prepared Matters. We welcome you all. As we begin, we want to welcome you and take a moment to share the mission of the Parkinson's Foundation. Every day, in everything that we do, we are working to make a life better for people with Parkinson's. To achieve our mission, we pursue three goals. Improve care for everyone with Parkinson's, advance research towards a, cur a cure, and empower and educate our global community. Today's program is a great example of one of these things that we are doing to help us meet these goals. Another example of our mission in action is PD generation. This research offers genetic testing for PD related genes and genetic counseling to people with Parkinson's at no cost. Commit to help us advance Parkinson's research today. Check out your eligibility and enroll now to be a part of PD generation at parkinson.org slash pdgeneration. You can also learn more about all that we have to offer the Parkinson's community by visiting our website, parkinson.org, or calling or emailing our helpline at 1-800-4-PD-INFO or helpline at parkinson.org. And now I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Rick Ostrander. Rick is an Aware and Care Ambassador for the Parkinson's Foundation. He moved to Beaufort, South Carolina in 2009 to care for his father who passed away in 2015 from complications associated with Parkinson's disease. Rick started a local support group in 2010 to better understand Parkinson's disease and to help others. He became acutely aware of the issues that faced persons with Parkinson's disease when coming to the ER and the hospital system with his dad's experiences. Rick has spoken to various support groups at home health care agencies, elder care education, and area hospitals on the importance of being aware in care. He continues to co-lead that support group and do, does so virtually during this pandemic. Rick, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate it very much. And I'm happy to be here. Boy, what a crowd, over 200 folks attending. That's, uh, that's amazing, that's great. Uh, so what I'd like to do is cover the Aware and Care and Toolkit that, that uh, the Parkinson's Foundation has. And before I start into that, let me just give you a little bit of background about the, this kit and the Aware and Care program itself. Uh, my father, as Laura mentioned, had Parkinson's. He passed away in 2015. Uh, I moved uh, to Buford from Texas to take care of him and, you know, became part of that sandwich generation, if you will. And in doing that, I started a support group to try and understand better about what Parkinson's was, uh, what is it, what it is, what I need to be aware of with it, etc. And after having several uh, occasions to take my dad or accompany him to the ER and seeing the experience uh, that occurred there and, and the difficulty for him to adjust coming back out of the hospital, uh, I realized that there needed to be something more. And at the time, before it was Parkinson's Foundation, the National Parkinson's Foundation had actually come up with this Aware and Care Kit. And we're, what we're gonna do today is talk about how important this kit is and the tools that it provides to you to be an advocate for either yourself or your, uh, uh, if you're a care partner for the spouse that has Parkinson's while they're in the hospital. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and let's see, let me just request control here. Sorry about this. Okay, so let's just go to the next slide. So Aaron, I'm gonna let you just run the, run the slide. So the next slide, so why we're here today, uh, quite honestly, it's, it's about helping you to understand that there are risks associated with hospital stays. 
And as a result of those risks, there are tools available, particularly our Aware and Care Kit, that can provide an active grow in your care while you're there. There's, uh, whether you're going to have a planned or unplanned visit to the hospital, you need to be prepared. And the Aware and Care Kit will help you do with re regardless of whether it's a, a plan because you have a surgical procedure that needs to be done or it's some plan and you're entering through, through the ER. And it gives you a strategy, if you will, on how to get the best possible care while you're in the hospital. Next slide. So, you know, off the, just off the bat, when we think about a hospital, right, we, we presume that folks like Dr. Muhammad with all their years of experience, uh, with all the staff that a hospital has, that they're gonna know everything about me, about why I'm there and being able to take care of me. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. Uh, presuming that they're gonna call your neurologist to understand better the medications that you're taking and, and the importance of when those medications need to be given, uh, whether or not there may be additional history, like if you, my dad went in and presented with a minor stroke one time, uh, being able to talk to the neurologist, was there any other strokes? What were those symptoms, et cetera? Uh, being assured that they'll understand what drugs you're on and what drugs are contraindicated. And we'll talk a bit more about uh, that in a moment. And that you get your drugs on time. So unfortunately, there's a reason why coming into a hospital for someone with Parkinson's isn't always uh, the best outcome. So let's, let's turn to the next slide. So compared to others, so people with Parkinson's will have a higher rate of, of hospitalizations. And that, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If you think about it, uh, a lot of us have issues with tremors, with our gait, we're prone to falls, we're a fall risk. And as a result, we may enter the hospital because we've taken a fall and we need to be uh, brought in to confirm whether there's any broken bones or to address uh, any potential skin tears and issues. And you know, speaking uh, from my father's experience, he was in assisted living and there's regulations in place. If he fell, uh, they were required to transport him to the hospital. So again, higher rate of hospitalization. Besides that, oftentimes there's a longer duration of hospitalization and we'll get into why that, that happens. Uh, based on studies, it's anywhere from two to 14 additional days. Primarily, it's a result of avoidable complications that are higher than for your peers. I'll give you an example. Unfortunately, uh, I had to visit the ER right before the holidays. I had what uh, is called a T TIA, right? TIA, I think it was, a minor stroke. Um, and by the time I was uh, into the hospital and in the ER, it had gone back to baseline. So it was a matter of just going through lots of tests uh, understanding what I might need to do post-operative, uh, not operation, but post-care, uh, back at home, et cetera. But for someone in Parkinson's, oftentimes the nature of, of why they're in the hospital doesn't permit them to necessarily get discharged back to their home. So as you see, this statistic, 63% will be discharged to a facility. So as an example, if you come in and you have broken bones as a result of, uh, of a fall, chances are you may go to a rehab center. Uh, if you have wounds that uh, maybe aren't healed properly, but you're not gonna stay in the hospital, they may actually send you to a nursing home. Uh, in South Carolina, you can't really go assisted living. You actually would go to a nursing care to ensure that those wounds heal properly, et cetera. So there's all sorts of reasons why you may find yourself actually having to uh, not being discharged to go home again. All right, so let's talk about what the odds are. So if you imagine that there's 12 persons with Parkinson's, we already know there's a greater chance that people with Parkinson's are gonna be hospitalized anyway. Four of those 12 people, right? Roughly that 40% are going to be hospitalized this year. Of those four, three of those four will not get the right medicine on time. That's 75% of the, 
of you that go into the hospital that have Parkinson's are not gonna get your meds on time. Of those three, two are gonna have a complication as a result of that. So that's, that's fairly significant. And these typically are avoidable complications as we'll see as we go through the presentation. So why does this occur? Uh, there's really four reasons that it does. Think about it this way, mismedications. Uh, I've fallen, I'm being transported to the ER. I'm in the ER, they're trying to figure out what's wrong. They need to get scans on me, et cetera. As a result, I miss my meds, right? They're doing other things. I can't get my meds on time. I don't have my meds with me as an example. Medication gets omitted. Uh, sometimes, depending on what you present to the ER doctor, if you're coming in through the ER, they want to make sure that they get a baseline of all of your uh, symptoms, et cetera, and, so, and vitals. So they'll withhold medications until they try and understand what is the underlying reason for these symptoms that they're seeing. You may get delayed. I mentioned I went to the ER. It was probably, I went into the ER at about six o'clock. I was in my hospital bed about one o'clock in the morning. So again, it's a delay. So if I was on my Parkinson's, med on Parkinson's medications and I missed my evening go to bed meds, now they've been delayed for me or they get substituted. I think all of you can appreciate the fact that your drugs that you take to cover your Parkinson's symptoms were probably medicated, dealt with uh, over a long period of time. I know it took, I'd say three to four months, maybe longer for my dad to get on a routine with his carbidopa, levodopa medications. Those medications are often based on a certain brand. So your experience, do I take them before I eat? Do I take them after I eat? What happens if I eat a lot of protein for dinner? Do I take them with dinner? All those sorts of things may be specific to your case because of the brand that you have. Well, in a hospital, typically they'll want you to utilize the brands that they have in their pharmacy, and they won't always carry all these medications, particularly if you're taking some of these formularies that have to do with infusion. So it's, rather than a pill, it's through a pump. You go in, you may not find that they have Ritari as a, as a medication that they can give you. And this is why we'll talk more about the importance of bringing your meds to the hospital and having some tools and an advocate that can help you uh, to communicate the importance that you get these meds on time. So again, just to summarize, if you think about anti-Parkinson medications, medications that treat the symptoms of Parkinson's, they're as necessary to you as insulin is to a diabetic. Those schedules are important. Uh, we all know that Parkinson's, the, the old adage, you know, if you met one person with Parkinson's, that's all you've met is one person with Parkinson's. It's a very individualized disease. And as a result, uh, having those medications tailored to you and to be able to continue that process that you've put in place to help treat your uh, symptoms is very important. So why does this happen? Is the hospital doing this on purpose? Absolutely not. Everyone there wants to help you. Unfortunately, there is a lack of awareness of the critical importance of medication timing. I presented to a hospital recently at a, at a lunch bag. It was to, or a brown bag, I guess I should say. And it was a pharmacy and a lot of the different nursing care areas. And when I asked if anyone under, had Parkinson's, I had three or four hands show up. Well, when we talked about medications, some of the colleagues said, oh, that's not a big deal. And I didn't even have to speak up. The people that were there who either had family members or uh, persons that they knew that were on medications, they absolutely talked about the critical importance of that timing. So it's just a lack of awareness. Uh, it's a lack of awareness that poorly managed Parkinson's may result in mental confusion. Again, I'll give you an example of my father. Uh, 
before I had a wear and care kit and understand the importance of medications and contraindications and whatever, um, he actually started hallucinating in his hospital bed. He thought because they had taken off of all his Parkinson's meds that he was hallucinating. And as a result, I mean, the hallucination was someone was pouring gasoline on his bed and he was worried they were gonna light it with a match. It was very real to him. And as a result, uh, fortunately at the time, I wasn't around, but the uh, director of the assisted living uh, residence that he was in was able to come up and stay with him and help calm him down. But importantly, there's often drugs that are given for people because of depression or psychosis that may occur while they're in the hospital. A lot of confusion happens uh, when you wake up and you find yourself in, in the hospital that are unsafe or they're contraindicated to Parkinson's medications. And there's some of those drugs that if you are given those drugs, uh, they can cause very serious complications. So just so you know, even in the best hospitals, this can occur. The foundation is very proud of their centers of excellence. Uh, they go through and they routinely uh, evaluate them to carry that centers of excellence. But we all acknowledge even in those cases, you may find pockets where uh, either the process isn't quite there yet in place uh, for uh, dealing with Parkinson's patients differently from the general patient population. So just remember this, number one, each person with PD has a unique combination of medications and regime. We've talked about that and the importance of you getting the right drug at the right time in the right circumstance. Each person with PD has the best knowledge of their disease as well as other conditions, but they may have com communication challenges. A lot of us with Parkinson's disease, uh, we do have communication challenges. I know that with my father, he was very soft-spoken. Uh, he often knew exactly what he wanted to say, but because it would take a while to get his thoughts together, there was often times where a person would interject and try and answer for him. So being able to communicate at a time of critical need, especially when you're in through the ER, that's why it can be very important to have someone there with you who understands the importance of being aware and care. And that's what a care partner can do. They can be an advocate for you. And if you go to most hospitals these days, you'll see signs all over the place encouraging you to speak up. And then the aware and care materials that we're gonna talk about here, uh, this kit, if you will, uh, they have materials in place that will help you get through from admission through discharge. So there's uh, practices in here that you can put in place that are going to make this end-to-end -end experience much better for you so that rather than being one of the two of the three, you can be the one of the three that doesn't have complications as a result of your hospitalization. So aware and care, the kit, it's here to help you. Uh, it's a campaign, it's a national campaign. It's to help everyone be better informed. So as I mentioned, this kit's actually been around for a number of years, but since the Parkinson's Foundation has taken on complete ownership of this kit, uh, it's now been expanded. I want to assure you, this is what's great about this kit is it was designed with movement disorder specialists, neurologists, uh, nurse practitioners, nurses, social, uh, sociology folks, uh, uh, hospitalists, discharge uh, administration folks. They were all involved in putting together this kit in terms of what it should contain, how it should read, and how to uh, explain the process to folks. So I would encourage everyone who does not already have this kit to go to the Parkinson's Foundation site and for $8 you can have this kit mailed to you. And importantly, the Parkinson's Foundation at no cost has most if not all of the materials that you'll find in that kit on the website that you can download and print off. I think there's a medical bracelet that you obviously don't download, but everything else that's paper-based they have PDF forms and you are able to download those and put them in your kit as you use them up. 
So the Aware and Care Kit will help patients and families plan for a hospital visit and advocate for the best possible care during the stay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now, next slide. Uh, these are just stories. So it, look no further than this slide. The foundation's helpline gets calls all the time uh, of folks talking about how important it was for them to have the kit and how appreciative they were that they did have the kit. Uh, it saved them from having complications. Let's talk about some of the materials that are in the kit. I've already mentioned that you can download most of the materials for free. Uh, the packet itself is free. There's simply an $8 shipping charge that's requested. Uh, there's the website, which I'm sure will be made available to you, maybe through chat. Uh, that you can go to in order to order your kit or to look for uh, materials. So some of the more critical components of the kit, nurse, nurse uh, tear-off pads, fact sheets. So again, the person you interact with the most during your stay in a hospital often is a nurse. And those changes, shift changes. So if you're in there longer than a day, you're going to go through two or three nurses that are responsible for your care. Having these fact sheets available that you can hand to them, it explains a little bit about Parkinson's. It talks about critical care considerations. And most importantly, it also talks about medications to avoid. So should something uh, get prescribed to you, they're able to look at that and say, oh, it's contraindicated, let's find something else that's going to work in the same way, but will not inhibit uh, the Parkinson's meds that you're taking. So those are available. There's a medical alert card. All of you that have Parkinson's, I'd highly encourage you to get some type of alert card. You might get an alert bracelet. I like the card. It came in real handy for my dad. Uh, he had a card at the time uh, before he got uh, significant, got into a later stage of Parkinson's, he was still driving and he happened to fall before he could get into his car. And it allowed him to communicate appropriately with someone uh, about an emergency contact. And more importantly, it indicate, you know, I'm not toxicated because unfortunately when someone sees someone like when my dad fell, the anxiety, the stress levels high, his tremors get much more pronounced as a result. And for someone that's not familiar with Parkinson's, they might interpret that differently, which could lead to, you know, could be problematic, if you will. Uh, other materials, medication forms. Now, these medication forms could come in real handy. I'd encourage you to have these on hand, but I will tell you that one of the things that, that I encourage people in the support group that have these kits and that we did for my father is to keep samples, say two to three doses worth at least of each of your meds and you can rotate them out. So as the next 90 day dose comes in from the pharmacy, right? You can take what you previously had and rotate them into this kit, if you will. And that by having your meds in there, including in the bottles, then it's very easy for you if you have the kit with you, and that's critical to have the kit with you, so that when someone asks what meds you're on, uh, you can show them the kit and show the, all the meds that you have in there, either by the form or with the medications themselves. It also uh, helps you to have some dosages in place in case you need to take some before you get fully admitted into the hospital. And again, for some folks, it's a great place to have all their meds in one place and keep them in the kit. So if something does happen and you have that kit or you can call home and say, hey, bring my kit with me, they don't have to hunt around for all your meds. They just bring the kit because they know there's some examples of your medications in the kit. Here's something that's come up. I, I believe if I'm not mistaken, this action plan actually was created prior to COVID. And this was a great addition to the kit because it describes six steps for optimum care. And there's a checklist in here. So if you have a planned visit, if you know you're gonna come in for some type of procedure ahead of time, you can go through this checklist and plan out a strategy around your visit and work with your doctors to ensure that, you're, that they have the best understanding of the care that you need and the special considerations that you have. And since we've had COVID, the foundations also had 
a doctor draft uh, the um, template of a letter that your neurologist can sign off on indicating their expectations of the hospital staff while you're in the hospital in terms of keeping them informed, et cetera. So some great, great tools that are uh, available in the kit here. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, some of us have DBS. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see some of us use uh, Duopa. So there's actual fact sheets in the kit that come in the kit. Again, you can download that talk about deep brain stimulation and some of the precautions you need. You certainly need to be able to communicate this to folks, you know, if they're, if you come in and you're presenting a fall and they want to look at a MRI, MRI or CAT scan on your brain, they're going to want to know if you have implant devices. And again, making sure that someone's aware of that is, is extremely important. And then the next slide talks about Duopa and the complications and what they need to know and some uh, precautions if you are taking Duopa. All right, so in summary, it's Aware and Care is uh, it's a national program. It's this kit, sorry, keep going the wrong way here. And um, it's to educate folks and to help you strategize and try and be that one out of the three and not the two out of the three that end up having complications and therefore longer stays uh, in the hospital, more expense, more trial and tribulations for you and your family. So in summary, let me just give you uh, just a little bit of verb about what we do as the wear and care ambassadors. Uh, we are volunteers. We volunteered and went through a course on the Aware and Care Kit and the program itself. Uh, I have been invited to mentor and present at some of the training classes that additional uh, volunteers uh, for the uh, next phase of the program uh, to help them understand what we've done. Our purpose, educate the community, educate clinicians who treat Parkinson's. I know there appears to be some doctors on uh, in the chat that I've noticed, uh, as well as educate hospital staff. And I'm fortunate enough that we do have a hospital uh, system here in Buford that's been very uh, 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 willing to listen to us and to consider this program. And we hope that once we can get through this whole COVID mess and that they can focus their resources appropriately that we can look at how we can filter people that come into the ER so that those that have Parkinson's can get identified and can be followed around during their migration from, you know, out, uh, from intake to ER to maybe full admission into the hospital so that they can get followed and tracked appropriately. So, Without further ado, uh, again, this is all made available for the foundation and we can talk about uh, this that Laura mentioned, the, the mission statement there. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Muhammad now and have him discuss uh, with us uh, more real uh, live in-person kind of things that we should expect and how we can deal with hospitalization. So Laura, back to you and Dr. Muhammad. Awesome. Thank you, Rick. Really appreciate that. Um, I am going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Natashata, um, doc, also known as Dr. Muhammad by most of his patients. Um, Dr. Muhammad was born and raised in Emporia, Kansas, and earned his medical degree from the University of Kansas School of Medicine, completed his neurology residency at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, after serving as chief resident, he completed a movement disorder fellowship training at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and then returned to Kansas City in 2008. He now works full time as the neurology attending physician, staffing the inpatient neurology consultation service at KU Medical Center. In his role, he works with inpatient medicine, psychiatry, rehabilitation, and surgery services to assess and address the neurological issues affecting hospitalized patients. 
He also educates neurology residents, internal medicine residents, and medical students with an emphasis on understanding how systematic medical disease can affect patients neurologically. Dr. Muhammad, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Laura. And I wanna thank Rick uh, for uh, what a great message. I mean, this is such an important program and I'm very happy to participate today. Um, you know, there are so many different types of neurologists and I think even some of our medical students who are becoming doctors are surprised when we talk about that there are 30 different types of subspecialties even within neurology. Normally we think about um, cardiology or GI or different specialties within medicine, but even among neurologists, movement disorder specialists like me, that's sort of one subspecialty. But then neurohospitalist is also a different specialty. So this has been something that I've had the uh, opportunity to be involved with over the last 13, 14 years full time is taking care of people in the hospital. And you sort of uh, see patients with Parkinson's disease and what the issues they go through. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides here. Are those coming through okay? Yes, they look great, thank you. Okay, so, um, you know, it's definitely a situation where the points that Rick made are, I think are very important. I'm gonna try not to repeat a lot of the things he said, but I'm gonna try to have it fit together. Um, if you look at how long it takes for hospital statistics to be updated, uh, it actually, there's about a one and a half to two and a half year lag time. And so this slide actually has some of the data um, published in 2019, from even a couple years before that. And I've actually um, interacted with some people at the American Hospital Association, and they actually have some uh, statistics that are coming through already, even now with COVID-19 and the pandemic. And it's very interesting if you look at these numbers, um, the major uh, differences I'll point out are that actually we have about 100 fewer hospitals in the United States. There are many hospitals in smaller towns or uh, emergency critical care access hospitals, where they have not financially been able to survive some of the difficult uh, um, things we've go we were going through even before the pandemic. Uh, the number of hospital beds is about 20,000 less than it was uh, two years ago. But the number of hospitalizations has actually been about the same, 36 million. And so you, people may be surprised by that because they think, okay, well, with COVID-19, there's so many more people in the hospital, but people are hospitalized all the time for all sorts of other reasons. Uh, and uh, that's especially true in Parkinson's disease. I have a couple of statistics from my area, Kansas and Missouri. But the overall uh, hospital expense in the United States has gone up from 1.06 trillion two years ago to actually 1.16 trillion. So the cost of all this continues to increase. And when you add that people are in the hospital longer with Parkinson's disease, you're gonna be much more likely to add to that cost uh, let alone the experiences that uh, Rick was talking about, you know, with his dad. So what, why are people hospitalized? Well, these are some of the major reasons. Um, only about 15% of people who come to the hospital with Parkinson's are not moving as well or having uh, motor function. Sometimes that's not because of their Parkinson's disease is progressing. It may be that if it's something acute within several days or even over the past week or two, uh, they may be uh, developing an acute uh, infection or some sort of other acute medical problem that's uh, dragging down the ability of the brain to function well. Of course, falls and fractures were mentioned. People can become more confused with Parkinson's disease because any brain disease where you become medically ill, especially with infection or inflammation or electrolyte imbalance or other organs not working like the liver or kidneys, you can be more likely that abnormal chemicals that our bodies would normally get rid of can build up in the system. And a lot of that is extra traffic that directly affects the ability of our brain neurons to communicate with one another. There are situations where people progress to the point where they're not functioning well at home and finally some family members will bring people in and it turns out they don't have something acute. And this has really been growing for a long time and they are having dementia and it's just been becoming increasingly difficult to take care of a loved one. But uh, fortunately, that doesn't happen too often, and there may be other resources that would help them get the care they need without having to be hospitalized. Fluctuating blood pressures resulting in low blood pressure and passing out or syncope is definitely a, a common problem, especially during the hotter uh, winter or summer months, especially July and August. 
um, people with Parkinson's disease are regular folks also. And so why do other people come to the hospital? Cardiac issues, chest pain, heart attacks, GI problems. Uh, and then some of the late stage complications involve uh, difficulty with motor fluctuations, uh, severe dyskinesias, uh, other mobility problems that uh, may not happen as often uh, to people who are earlier on in the course of their Parkinson's disease. Medication timing is huge, but you know, what if people, for example, they need you to not uh, uh, take your medicines or eat any food, nothing by mouth, NPO. There, a lot of times in hospitals, this starts at midnight. And so even if somebody's going to have a surgery or if they're going to have a procedure, there may even be situations where they don't want people to eat for several hours because they want to do some sort of uh, abdominal scan uh, and they don't want people to become nauseated or vomiting. Uh, he mentioned, Rick mentioned the ability for medications to be available. Do they get substituted? Are those substitutions going to work as well? Many expensive brand names, even in centers of excellence, are not on formulary because it costs the hospital so much more money to have all this extra medication lying around when there may or may not be that many people on a daily or weekly basis who will use it. So these are all realities that we try to work around. What are some ways that in the hospital we can work around the need for taking pills? Well, there are the orally disintegrating tablets of carbidopa, levodopa. Um, these are sometimes called uh, parcopa. Uh, and there's also a transdermal dopamine agonist, the rotigotine patch or nupro. Uh, some people can do intramuscular uh, and actually more recently subcutaneous injections of apomorphine or apokin. Uh, for people who are allowed to uh, receive medications through the GI tract, but maybe they're having swallowing problems, which can sometimes happen in Parkinson's disease, and that are worse when you're more likely to be ill, rather than choking and aspirating and having pneumonia risk, they may place a Corpac or a nasogastric tube through the nose, crush up pills, um, and you know deliver them that way. But of course, when you crush medications, uh, medicines that are extended release, for example, don't have that extended release benefit. And so they end up being uh, released immediately. So even that needs to potentially be adjusted. The take home point that I would hope most healthcare professionals in a hospital setting would uh, take away, and hopefully patients and family members and caregivers also, less is more during a hospital stay. The goal is to try to navigate this sort of below average experience in your life and get through the hospital stay so you can get out, improve, recuperate, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about therapy and rehab. Those numbers that Rick shared, I think, are very important to remember. It's not even so much that people don't get to go home, although that is a reality, and it is a, a concern and a surprise for many people. In many situations, being able to go to assisted living or, or, not, or not assisted living, skilled rehab, inpatient rehab, the goal is actually to try to rehab and get stronger and better so that you are able to function more like where you were at at home. Even being in a hospital bed for five to 10 days, whether you have Parkinson's or not, can to cause enough debility and weakness where if you already are prone to motor problems, it may be more challenging or difficult to be able to go home. And then you set somebody up for failure where they end up getting readmitted to the hospital within several hours to days even, let alone a week or two. So having that rehabilitation process is actually a standard part of what we try to engage them even the first day when people come to the hospital uh, with Parkinson's disease to make sure that we're not going to have uh, a backslide as you're trying to get through your acute medical situation. The overall idea too is when you think about being in the hospital, people in general, even without Parkinson's, they're not as mobile. You're going to spend a lot of time in a bed. Maybe people will get up to the chair. There can certainly be times where people who are mobile are getting up and going to the bathroom, but people who don't feel well and there's a lot of time in the bed. So many times people may not need their full dose of mobility medications with Parkinson's disease, especially if more medicine might add to delirium or hallucinations. The goal is really just to try to make sure you have enough so that you're not falling. And then you also have to gauge and balance the effectiveness of medications versus side effects. The other thing that I wanna mention is that there are a lot of situations where people with Parkinson's disease have a variety of symptom complaints. When you are in an environment like a hospital stay and you tell somebody, that you are having loose stools. This is not interpreted as like a comment, like, okay, I'm sorry to hear that. Maybe we should like adjust your diet. People in healthcare are helpers. And so if 
you tell somebody that you're having loose stools, they're going to be like, let me give you some loperamide or Imodium, thinking I'm just trying to treat your symptoms, but that's a medication that can block acetylcholine in the brain, make hallucinations worse, make a delirium worse. And so, you know, you take a situation where a doctor was trying to help your symptom, whereas if you were at home, would you have taken a loperamide if you had loose stools? Maybe not. Maybe you would have just adjusted what you were eating or, you know, cut back on the Taco Bell or whatever you're doing so that you're not having that problem. So it, when you're a captive audience in the hospital, hospital, sometimes the idea of I'm having a symptom or problem, I need to take a pill. They, they, you know, it's very easy to over-prescribe medications that may or may not be necessary. People talk about delirium. And so another term that comes up in the hospital is encephalopathy. Anybody with any brain disease, somebody who's had a stroke, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, they're much more likely that their brain is not going to be able to withstand the usual chemical imbalances that happen when you're sick. Imagine people who don't have Parkinson's or when you were younger, had blue, and you're like, I'm going to tough this out. I'm going to go to work. And they're like, why are you here at work? You're going to get, make all of us sick. But if you show up at work, people are not gonna function 100% even when they have the flu. And that's not just because they're sick, it's because the chemicals that the immune system is releasing, even to fight an infection, mess with the usual traffic. It's like a traffic jam in your brain. Your, when people have a brain disease, they're much more likely to suffer the side effects from that. So uh, all of these different things uh, can be worse. So if somebody already has some anxiety, it could be worse. If they already have a lot of problems with tremor, the tremor could be worse. If a person has a droopy eyelid and then they get sick, the droopy eyelid is worse. So it doesn't have to be something that's a substantial neurological problem, but it tends to be worse when people are sick. One of the things, you know, communication, you talked about, uh, Rick, about how your dad's a quiet voice. Communication is such a, an important issue and some of communication is also receiving information. So I run into a situation a lot where people say, oh, you know, you're gonna be here in the hospital. These hearing aids are $4,000. We should take them home because we don't want them to get lost or we don't want them to get stolen. And so then people have hearing loss. And then when they're sick, their higher level brain ability to process what you hear, well, the input is not good. And so then people that actually adds to delirium. Somebody who has good hearing, um, who is not going to have that problem. But people who already have hearing loss, there's a lot of audiology research showing that people will be more likely to process and have less delirium if they can hear and process what's going on. Same thing with vision. There are many people who get older, even if they don't have Parkinson's disease, who have very severe cataracts. And they say, well, this person has advanced dementia. Do we really wanna put them through a procedure? As a neurologist who tries to avoid unnecessary surgery for patients, I would say that even a person with advanced dementia, if they have profound vision loss because of a cataract, that may actually be a worthwhile procedure because they can see better, even if they don't know where they are, there's something that their brain processes about the familiarity of what they see. This is why having family members present at the bedside or familiar objects from home, even photographs or uh, just familiar memorabilia, um, you know, bring it, take a box and pack it and bring it to the hospital, that can reduce delirium uh, without even changing anything related to the medications. It's been a problem during the pandemic because with COVID-19, there are limitations on how many visitors there can be. And in many cases, if you're COVID positive, uh, no family members are allowed to see you just because of infection spread. So these are additional barriers that we're running into. If you sort of look at an overall progression of how people do over time, if you look at the green slide, uh, and this is really, it's a, it's a slide. You can see it's sort of sliding down. I sort of like to think of this as the older I get, the better I was. Uh, but this is true even with normal aging. But when people have a, a, a tendency to decline over time, uh, when a person has an acute medical problem, there can be a setback. And so you can see at the very left side of this, uh, of the screen, you know, you have a, a trajectory where somebody's going down and they sort of go downhill. And they don't improve right away. It may take some time where things sort of level off and then there can be an improvement and the goal is to try to get as close back to baseline as you can. But the problem is if you have multiple hospital stays within a several month period or even within a six to 12 month uh, period, 
if you have cumulative times where you're sort of stepping down through the process, as you're sort of declining, it may be increasingly difficult to try to approach that usual trajectory. I'll just give you an example. Let's say that somebody comes into the hospital and they have a bladder infection, and then we treat them with antibiotics. And then the antibiotics uh, 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 impair their normal bacteria in their body, and then they end up getting a yeast infection. And so then they get treated with that. And now they've been on multiple antibiotics, uh, antifungal, antibacterial, and let's say they develop a clostridium difficile diarrhea, colitis infection of the intestines. Now you've started having one step back after another, and you're just trying to improve to where you would need to be, but there's not necessarily a full recovery. And this is one of the things that we see, especially people who are more frail. That's where having better control of your Parkinson's disease, exercise, being in a better situation. And this doesn't even talk about things like heart attacks or strokes or other things, cancer, that can affect people with Parkinson's unrelated to their Parkinson's disease. So this is one of the reasons why a lot of people have a setback is because the brain is not able to rebound as quickly from these um, multiple uh, cumulative uh, attacks. Anesthesia is a reality and it's an important part of, uh, you know, thank God for anesthesia, right? I mean, we need to be able to have procedures where people are not in pain or they don't have memory of the uh, difficulty of going through the, the uh, procedure. But, you know, the problem is that when your person has Parkinson's disease, there can be less predictable effects. Most of the time we, uh, you know, and, and our anesthesiology faculty are very knowledgeable. There's so many subspecialists, even among anesthesiologists who are very familiar with some of these interactions. But then you think about, for example, it's less predictable when somebody has a brain disease. Could the medicine last longer in the system? Could it affect other chemicals in a way that's less predictable? Sometimes people can end up having uncoordinated involuntary movements because they're having more rigidity or muscle weakness, which can in turn affect breathing. Uh, people can have more weakness of the throat and swallowing muscles after time. So when they've had their surgery, they're trying to recuperate. Now you're just trying to get through this and not aspirate or have cooling of secretions uh, that cause pneumonia. There can also be lots of uh, effects, even without Parkinson's disease, where some of these uh, anesthesia medications can affect your GI tract. It can take a while for the uh, esophagus and uh, small uh, stomach and small intestine and large intestine to wake up. So people who are already having GI problems in Parkinson's disease, these are some of the non-motor things that we see. So they can have problems with poor appetite, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, heartburn, slowing of gastrointestinal motility or an ileus. And then of course, there's the, the psychosocial aspects. There's the mood, thinking, cognition, changes in behavior, delusions or hallucinations. We're not saying that all of these things are a permanent setback, but sometimes people, it can take them several weeks to really recuperate, especially depending on the type of surgery they had, uh, what the predictable usual recuperation time will be. And then of course, when they're going to remove the uh, breathing tube that they put people on during the procedure, there can also be more tremor and rigidity at that time. And so you don't want to have injury or other setbacks that can prolong your hospital stay. I have a whole slide just uh, mentioning urinary tract infection. I would say probably 70% of people who gradually are noticing mobility change within a very short period of time, maybe three to five days or even up to two or three weeks. They come to the ur to urgent care or they come to the emergency room and they end up having a bladder infection. The same rigidity of the arms and legs or neck that we see in Parkinson's disease can also cause stiffness of the urinary bladder, which makes it difficult to completely empty the bladder. Unlike a younger person having full-blown symptoms of a urinary tract infection, fever, uh, chills, uh, bladder pain, painful urination, and abnormal odor of the urine, most people with Parkinson's disease don't have these symptoms. They have no symptoms at all. Maybe they feel like they're going to the bathroom a few more times a day, but that may be very subtle. We specifically look for a bladder infection. You don't even have to have a full-blown infection. Sometimes our internal medicine colleagues say, you know, this urinalysis doesn't really look that bad, but they haven't crossed the threshold where we would use antibiotics. If you have bacteria and or white blood cells in your urine and the specimen is clean and not contaminated, we would recommend treating because having the presence of white blood cells in your urine means that there's an inflammatory response, which by itself can add to delirium. The definition of a complicated urinary tract infection is one where your bladder infection actually is causing confusion or altered mental status. 
So we have a much lower threshold to give a one-time dose of antibiotics and clear that up so that people can recuperate. Remember, we got to try to escape back to you know our baseline if we can. This is an example of aspiration pneumonia. You see the haziness within the circle. The same rigidity and bradykinesia that happens with finger tapping or hand movements or foot tapping can also affect coordination of swallowing. So when stuff goes down the wrong tube into the lungs, you know, my professor um, at uh, my neurology professor who's retired used to say, pneumonia is the old man's friend. It's the friend that takes him from this life to the next. So, I mean, this is definitely something that uh, it can be a huge issue. And many people with Parkinson's uh, disease who die in the hospital, it's often because they are not able to recuperate from pneumonia. Lying in a bed for long periods of time, poor mobility, difficulty rolling over in bed. People can end up having sites of potential tissue breakdown, either the back of their head, shoulders, lower back or hips, sacrum, buttocks, heels. There may be protective uh, uh, pads that people can wear underneath. It's a very important thing, not only in the hospital stay, but even in um, nursing homes and, uh, and long-term care facilities to uh, turn people every two hours uh, so that they're having less skin breakdown. But being able to have nursing assessments to look at the tissue and make sure we're not having enough breakdown uh, where that's adding to a problem. These areas can develop infection and that's another setback with more antibiotics and wound care. And uh, even if people are discharged from the hospital, they'll need a lot of follow-up. So it's a huge problem. Um, trauma, when people uh, fall and hit their head, even if no brain cells have bleeding, like you see in this picture, the top left, you can see an epidural hematoma, which is usually you get from rupture of an artery. So it stays in one area around the brain, as opposed to a subdural hematoma on the top right, where a vein may tear. You know, with shrinkage of the brain, as we all get older, there's more space. And if a person falls, those veins along the outside of the brain can tear and glub, 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 very slowly trickle blood. This sometimes sneaks up on people, even for days or a week after they've fallen and hit their head. And then they're getting more confused and the scan shows a low pressure venous uh, uh, bleeding, which is a subdural hematoma. And then other people can bleed into the subarachnoid space and get all these bright areas that sort of surround the spaces of the brain. And that's a subarachnoid hemorrhage. We can see that also when people have ruptured aneurysms in the brain. So these are some of the scenarios we run into. And then even people who don't bleed in the brain, they just traumatic injury. If you have stretching of neurons, you do not even have to hit your head. If you actually, I'm thinking of uh, headbangers. You've ever seen that movie Wayne's World where they're all rocking and hitting their head. Wayne and Garth for six minutes to Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, all that stretching and, and uh, pulling of neurons can actually make for injury and people can be more likely to be dizzy, have headaches, ringing in the ears, blurry vision that lingers for a while. So, you know, if a 20 year old person falls and hits their head and they're not acting right or they don't function well for even a whole year afterward, imagine an older person who has Parkinson's disease who already has a brain disease. This is a setback. And just because people are older or have Parkinson's doesn't make it okay to hit your head. It actually makes it worse, but we see it frequently with the falls. So it's a huge problem. Then, you know, if you have a fracture of a bone, it's not just enough that you have all these different types of fractures and some of them are more difficult to repair than others. Some of them require surgery. Some of them just require stabilization of the limb. Then imagine that if you have a long bone that breaks and there are all these fat particles that get released into the bloodstream. The picture on the right is actually a picture of the brain. And you can see all these tiny white areas are tiny, tiny fat emboli that are released in the bloodstream and are causing strokes in the brain. So this can be a setback for people who have trauma. Um, you know, it's literally like the definition of adding insult, in this case, an ischemic insult or stroke to injury. The GI tract is so important. There are some people who describe the enteric nervous system or the nervous system controlling the stomach and intestines as sort of a second brain. And so, you know, the whole, you are what you eat. If you've ever felt bloated or feel like you're, uh, stomach and intestines are not moving well, it affects how your brain functions and how you feel. And so it's a huge part of this. Having constipation that's backing up, having ileus, these are things we don't wanna see in people in the hospital, uh, but it can be a huge problem. If you just look at all causes of death in the United States, unrelated to Parkinson's, heart disease, cancer, now we actually have COVID, uh, you know, 
fluctuating depending on where we are in the pandemic, somewhere in the top three, either number one or sometimes down to two or three. But preventable injury is a huge uh, cause of death. Chronic lower respiratory diseases, especially emphysema or uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Stroke, uh, less people are dying from stroke than when I was in training, but that means that people will live chronically with their deficits, many, in many cases in a nursing home. Alzheimer's disease will continue to increase. Complications from diabetes, diabetes, influenza and pneumonia, kidney um, failure and infection, and then suicide. So there are a variety of fa factors that affect people. You know, a person with Parkinson's disease who may have psychosis uh, may be more likely to hallucinate uh, and be in a bad situation where they may um, not normally have uh, felt that they were suicidal. Look at what happened to uh, Robin Williams. You know, he ended up being diagnosed ultimately with dementia with Lewy bodies, but that's very similar clinically to what you would see with Parkinson's disease dementia. So, and then, you know, a topic that doesn't get a lot of attention, I think, uh, or not enough attention, but has been a real focus for the Parkinson Foundation has been palliative care. It's been described as the right kind of care for too late. It doesn't have to necessarily end in hospice, but sometimes uh, if a person, uh, if their goals change in life where they're like, I don't want to, it's not that I want to extend the length of my life, but I want the quality of my life, no matter how long I'm going to live, to be better. There are so many uh, factors that could be addressed and palliative care specialists can work together. They, these are doctors who specialize in trying to work on these important uh, points of emphasis. When people leave the hospital, long-term acute care hospitals, especially if they need prolonged ventilation or they have a tracheostomy, inpatient rehab, if you can do half an hour of therapy six times a day, speech therapy, occupational therapy, a physical therapy. Skilled rehab is more like a nursing home where you have, uh, I mean, it's, some of this is regional, and I think Rick's right about this, but um, there are places that are nursing homes that often have a separate unit where they already have the same employees who are therapists and nurses, and you can come short-term and have skilled rehab, but you don't end up staying in the nursing home, and then you go home after that. And then home health therapy is an option, but in many cases, the amount of therapy you get from somebody coming to visit you for 20 or 30 minutes three times a week, even though it's convenient because you don't have to go anywhere, may not uh, reach the same level of benefit as you might have if somebody can put you in a car or truck or van and go down the street and actually see an outpatient therapist. And again, the pandemic has affected a lot of access to this. So that's sort of an overview of some of the things we've run into. I wanna make sure we have some time for a few questions if we can. I saw the, in the question and answer, um, section, there's been uh, some different ones. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Um, I really appreciate the presentation. And there are a couple of questions that have come on. Um, the first one I'd like to ask you, and I know that you have a hard out here soon, um, but one of the ones that I think would be most helpful is how do we encourage folks to um, get their providers to work together as a coordinated team, as opposed to individualized um, working separately um, for one patient? Do you have it's any advice there? Struggle. It's an important question. You know, advocacy. I think what's great about this program is empowering people to speak up. There are a lot of people who are very kind who say, I don't want to, you know, this doctor is knowledgeable or this nurse is a professional. I don't want to bother them or I'm doing okay. I'm fine. I'm getting through it. And, uh, you know, just being able to say, you know, I just want to make sure about this. I want to make sure I'm bringing up the right things. There's a nice way to do that. And I think people, most people in healthcare are also uh, very patient centered and, and kind and want to be helpful. And sometimes what the doctor needs and what the nurse needs and what the patient needs is different. And so we need to work together. That's why it's called the chief complaint. What's your problem? It might be that somebody has leg pain and that's not my thing, but I need to listen about their leg pain and figure out what the problem is. And then if that means I call orthopedic surgery or I call a rehab doctor who can help address that issue, we may do that. So being, uh, being confident that you're not being bothersome, uh, you know, you're already there, you're in house, you're in a bed, um, you need help. Um, we all need help. And I think helping each other and being confident about asking for the things you need or just clarification on things. You know, when I look at two major medical textbooks, each of them have more than 400 chapters over medical topics. And each one of these books has one chapter on Parkinson's disease. And so if, 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 a, if a doctor is going to sit down, it's not like they memorize everything in these medical books. They may be able to say 5, 10, 15 things about Parkinson's disease, not 500. 
So being able to say, I'm concerned about this and have a question, even if they don't know the answer, they need to be able to look into it or figure it out rather than you know, just giving them free reign to be able to do whatever they need to do. Even in centers of excellence, not every nurse, for example, may be familiar with everything about Parkinson's. We have to do very individual training when people come to the hospital and say, we just want you to be aware that this patient needs their meds on time and here are some strategies we do to make sure that works. Awesome, thank you. Um, we'll take one other question for Dr. Muhammad. And, uh, we've got a couple of questions for Rick as well. Um, but Dr. Muhammad, could you speak to the importance of medical ID or first responder cards um, and how that might be helpful for folks who are living with Parkinson's? Well, my wife actually works in an emergency room. So she interacts on a daily basis with paramedics, EMTs, people who are first responders. These are heroes. I mean, they're going out there even before the pandemic. They're catching people in a bad time. They're bringing them to the hospital. They are not Parkinson's specialists. They're not neurologists. Anything you can do in one or two sentences or provide a card, especially if you can't speak, that says, these are the concerns I have. I think most paramedics and EMTs are gonna be open to that. Uh, they're not gonna be insulted or offended. Uh, and you know, again, it goes back to everybody has different agenda. They may be trying to stabilize you and get you to the hospital, but they also need to be open to what you have to say. So I think anything that increases communication uh, is a great start. But we don't expect them to be extremely knowledgeable about that. Even the medications they use in an emergency are often very uh, restricted and uh, managed by the medical director of the uh, emergency medical services team. Wonderful, thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Um, I have a couple questions that have come in for Rick. Um, Rick, about the, yes, thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Have a wonderful day. Sure. Um, Rick. Yes. One of these questions came in and, and we are living in this COVID world um, that has continued into 22, despite our best efforts. Um, and I think you mentioned, and, and Dr. Mohammed mentioned as well, some of the hospital restrictions around visitors and loved ones coming in um, with patients into the hospital. Do you have any advice on how folks can advocate for themselves or for their family members who are in the hospital when we can't get in there or that there are um, restrictions on visitors? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's so individualized depending on the hospital, right? Um, it, I was fortunate that when I went into the ER December 8th, I guess, uh, they did allow my wife to accompany me back, me back into the ER now. But I think it's like doc, uh, Dr. Muhammad said, for me, it's it's a matter of attending to them. So being there with them in the ER admissions area and advocating for them from there. Most hospitals will at least allow you to be in that, you know, they've got segregated areas in the ER because typically you don't bring yourself in, right? You're usually, uh, someone's driving you there with you. Maybe your care partner's bringing you in because you fell or what have you. But um, I guess all I would offer, and it's not great advice, is you just gotta be persistent. You, you gotta call, you gotta be persistent. I know you can talk to the, uh, the, the on-call nursing staff and you can relay the information to them that they have Parkinson's, they need their meds, here's your number, you know, call, get their number so you can call back. Uh, I, that's all you do is be persistent because you're right, with COVID and the quarantine, uh, they can be pretty, uh, pretty uh, I, I, I can't find the proper word, you know, that I can speak about keeping people away, so to speak. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's definitely more restrictive than we've had in the past. Yeah, so. it is. So I, I'm not sure I gave a great answer other than persistence. Yeah, it's a one. running theme here. Mm -hmm. um, what advice do you have for folks um, around updating their wear and care kit, um, reviewing the contents of that kit. Is that something that you did maybe with your father on a regular basis or do you have any advice around that? Yeah, sure. So uh, the honest answer is I did not look at updating my wear and care kit on a regular basis other than, you know, making sure that I had the meds. So I was very pleasantly surprised when the foundation, I became a wear and care ambassador and they had it. Now, what can you do about it? 
I find the best way when I need to make sure that things are up to date and that I'm not going to miss something is most people have access to Google or Safari or some calendar, online calendar. And I would simply create an event that on some periodic basis, once a quarter, perhaps, you go in and you go to the Parkinson's Foundation website and you look to see, because you're always keeping that information up to date, or you can call the hotline, right? Uh, that the foundation has and find out has the wear and care kit been updated uh, that might be appropriate to get information. So I'd probably put two things in. Once on a monthly basis, I'd make sure that I updated it with the appropriate sample of meds if I wasn't keeping all the meds in here and that I updated at best the uh, formulary, right? The prescription drugs that I take. So I'm doing that on a monthly basis. And then uh, on a quarterly basis, yeah, go out to the foundation website, which again, you could put in your calendar and have it repeat every three months, you know, on Saturday at 8 a.m. to remind you to go out to the website and do it. I think that would be the best thing that people could do to answer yeah. that question. Um, what about, is there an ideal place to keep your wear and care kit? Um, you know, That's a great question. About, yeah, yeah. And, but unplanned visits as well. Well, I mean, you know, granted, there are shipping charges. Uh, I think if I had it to do over with my dad, I probably, it may not have the meds uh, that you could take necessarily, but it would have the, per, the prescriptions I'm doing. I'd have a kit for the car and I've had a kit back uh, next to my dad's bed where I would administer the medicines. So I'd have a kit where I'm administering the meds and I've got it there with him. Uh, and then I'd have a kit in the car. That way, it's very unlikely that we'd be out and have some kind of emergency, an auto wreck or something come up where we didn't have at least the ability to bring the kit. For eight bucks, that's, you know, 16 bucks, that's cheap insurance. Sure. Thank you. All right. One last question. Um, did you have any, or do you think folks should have any um, notes or any short history um, on the Parkinson's patient symptoms or illnesses or anything like that? Wow. Um, included That's a great well. question. That is such a great question. Um, again, talking from my own experience, my dad was a, a geologist, so he was all about the scientific method and documenting things, et cetera. And so he did have quite a bio of his conditions, his surgeries, et cetera. What I found out, I started doing that myself. And so when I had my mini stroke and went into the hospital, I took mine with me, right? And what it taught me was it was way too long. I've now consolidated it once I got out to one page, but absolutely, I would encourage everyone, you know, Go out, create a PDF. You could go to a Google Doc or something so anyone could get on it, right? If you shared it appropriately and print a copy, put it, you know, put it in your kit so that you have it with you. But I'll tell you what, it, it'd be so easy because all the questions people are asking you and you're stressed as it is. How many surgeries have you had? What surgeries did you have? When did you have those surgeries? Have you had cancer? When did you have cancer? Are you allergic to drugs? Which drugs are you allergic to? What supplements do you take? So not everyone just takes meds, right? I didn't take meds prior to my stroke. I took lots of supplements thinking that being healthy, that would prevent strokes, right? Hmm. But you know, knowing the supplements that you're taking, because some supplements have issues with medications that they may want to give you. So yeah, I think whoever said that, absolutely, you're spot on. Put, put together a cheat sheet, cover the basis of what people ask, which is how old you are, uh, any surgeries you've had, medications that you're currently taking, if you want to put those in, and uh, you know, detail on those meds, even if it's just taking pictures and put, you know, you can then you can take a picture of that cheat sheet for your phone, right? You can store it on notes. You can take pictures of the labels of your supplements so that you can see the ingredients. And you typically are going to have your phone with you no matter where you go. 
Very good. Well, thank you, Rick. That was super helpful. And we really appreciate your time and your perspective. And, um, and thank you to Dr. Muhammad as well for, um, for sharing all of this wonderful information. For well, folks. thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank of you. course. All right. Well, folks, that concludes our program. Um, thank you to everyone else also for joining us today. Um, you will receive a follow-up email um, that will also be included, have the survey. Um, so please tell us what you think about today's program. Um, so you'll receive a link to today's presentation and additional resources all in that email. Um, we are excited to support the Parkinson's community by, found, uh, by funding programs through our community grants. The application is now open through January 28th uh, for organizations in the community who provide health, wellness, and educational programs that address unmet needs for the Parkinson's community. Please share this community, uh, this information with those in the community uh, who might be interested. And then also I hope that you'll join us for the rest of 2022 for our PD Health at Home series. Um, you can learn more about that and to view upcoming and archived we uh, webinars at parkinson.org slash PD Health. And finally, just a reminder that we are here for you. Um, if you had a question today that wasn't answered, please reach out to the helpline by calling one 800 for PD info or emailing helpline at parkinson.org. You can also use that same information to order our free resources, educational book series, and of course, the hospital safety aware and care kit that we have been talking about so much today. Um, portions of that kit can be downloaded from home um, and you can print them out yourself um, or you can order that full kit as well. We thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, stay well, and please come around and join us again for another PD Health at Home program very soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.